Well, I have the honor this evening of introducing and uh, welcoming our guest speaker. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Gibson is our speaker for this year's NSA lectureship series. Dr. Dr. Gibson is Associate Professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary. He has also served previously as Associate Minister at Cambridge Presbyterian Church in England. Dr. Gibson is a contributor to and co-editor of From Heaven He Came and Sought Her, Definite Atonement in Historical, Biblical, Theological, and Pastoral Perspective, uh, as well as having authored other articles in biblical theology. Tonight, Dr. Gibson will be giving the first lecture of his series titled, Glorious Dust, The Doctrine of Man. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Gibson. One thing I'm not gifted with uh, is height. So, uh, <clears throat> well, thank you to uh, Jonathan and uh, to Tim for the kind invitation to come and give these lectures. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not from around here. Uh, I'm from Texas, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> which is another country uh, east of here and uh, a little city called Belfast uh, in Northern Ireland. So hence the funny accent. Uh, I'm gonna give a series of lectures on uh, the doctrine of man, which I've entitled Glorious Dust, the doctrine of man. And tonight's lecture is entitled, Oh, what a piece of work is man. Uh, it will really be an expository lecture from Genesis chapter 2, so you may want to open that on your phones, or if you did bring a Bible. Uh, tomorrow's lecture will be in the same vein. Uh, it will be called um, Man Delights Not Me, an expository lecture on uh, Genesis 3 and Ephesians 4. Uh, but tonight is oh, What a Piece of Work is Man, and I'm going to begin by reading Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4 to 9 and then verses 15 to 17. Let us hear the word of God. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, but a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Oh, what a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. So wrote Shakespeare in his play Hamlet. Shakespeare expresses his admiration for man by looking at contemporary man his reason and faculties, his physique and movement, his acts and apprehension, 
before climaxing with that most complimentary of statements, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Oh, what a piece of work is man indeed. But if we are to understand man aright, then we need to begin not with contemporary man, as Shakespeare does, but with original man, as Scripture does. We need to begin with the first man, Adam. This is because Scripture ties mankind to the first man. In Genesis 1, 27, the word for man or mankind is Adam, and the name of the first man is Adam which means that our doctrine of man must begin with the first man, with Adam. And so in this lecture, I want to look at the doctrine of man under four headings that relate to Adam. Number one, the historicity of Adam. Two, the creation of Adam. Uh, Three, the covenant with Adam. And then four, the significance of Adam. So number one, the historicity of Adam. Was Adam a real man who lived at some point in history, or was he just a myth or a metaphor? The answer of Scripture is both conspicuous and perspicuous. The opening chapters of Genesis present Adam as the first man formed from the dust of the earth and from whom God formed the first woman. Uh, Together, this first man and woman, named Adam and Eve, constitute the fountainhead of the human race. Three genealogies in the Bible find their origin in Adam. Genesis 5, 1 Chronicles 1, Luke chapter 3. Jude also uses Adam as the alpha point of biblical history, describing Enoch as the seventh from Adam. Jesus refers to Adam and Eve without naming them, as the first married couple at the beginning of history. And the Apostle Paul employs the order of creation, Adam first, then Eve, to establish the role relationships of men and women in marriage and the church. The Apostle Paul speaks of Adam also as the one man from whom God made every nation of mankind, Acts 17. Adam is also used in biblical arguments to teach issues of sin and salvation. Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, the prophet compares Israel's transgression of the covenant to that of Adam's. Paul in the New Testament compares and contrasts the person and work of Adam pre-fall and post-fall with that of Christ. In Romans 5, for example, Paul speaks of Adam in his post false state as the one man through whom sin came into the world. Adam, Paul argues, uh, or Paul understands, Adam metaphysically, not metaphorically, through him sin, a real metaphysical thing, uh, brought death, another metaphysical thing, into existence. Uh, Paul also describes Adam as a type of Christ, Romans 5.14. In terms of biblical theology, for anything in the Old Testament to be a type, it first has to have a historical reality, a real person, a real place, a real ordinance, a real event. So for Adam to be a type of Christ in Romans 5.14, he himself would have to have been a historical person. Another example of Paul using Adam as a parallel to Christ is in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to Adam in his pre-fall state as the first man from the earth, a man of dust, and compares him to Jesus, whom he calls the second and last Adam. So, we can see that several passages of Scripture from both Old and New Testaments read Adam as a historical figure. It is hard to read these passages and conclude that God intended Adam to be read as a mythical or a metaphorical figure. Rather, he is presented conspicuously and perspicuously as a real historical man, the first living man of the human race. This means that our doctrine of man, whatever it is, must find its alpha point in this man, the first man in history, the Adam 
of Genesis. But what are the origins of Adam in Genesis? It's one thing to affirm his historicity. It's another to affirm his origins, which brings us to our second point, the creation of man, the creation of man or the creation of Adam. While evangelical and Reformed Christians have, generally speaking, affirmed that Adam was a historical figure, there is a diversity of opinion about his origins. The reason for the diversity is primarily because of scientific findings in paleontology, archaeology, anthropology, and genetics, all of which seem to call into question the Bible's account of mankind's common and natural descent from Adam. The result has been that some Christian pastors and scholars have adopted a hybrid position, now commonly known as theistic evolution, which itself has a broad spectrum. At the risk of oversimplification, theistic evolution is the view that God used evolution to create mankind. On this view, we evolved from apes to hominids to mankind via some kind of Adam figure about 10,000 years ago or up to 150,000 years ago. The theistic part is that God stepped into the evolutionary process and refurbished a hominid by imparting a soul to them or by beginning a divine relationship with them. Adam and Eve are thus viewed as special creations out of the hominid or the Neanderthal race. And as such, the pair serve as the headwaters of the human race. This does not mean that we all physically descended from this pair. Uh, God may have infused his image into a tribe or a race of hominids or entered into a relationship uh, with a tribe or a race of hominids, with Adam being the chieftain of the tribe. So that's theistic evolution in broad strokes, acknowledging there's a spectrum within it. Well, what are we as Christians to do with this general understanding of theistic evolution? Well, first as Christians, while we don't want to dismiss science outright, we must discern between different kinds of science, each with their own presuppositions. But more importantly as Christians, we must submit all scientific proposals and hypotheses to the final authority of Scripture. And so it is to Scripture we now turn, and in particular, I want us to look at Genesis 2, verse 7. This is the one text that theistic evolutionists like to skirt around or suggest that we shouldn't press the literal button on too much. Let me read the text again to you. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. I think from this one text, we can discern four boundary markers for affirming the orthodox origins of Adam. First, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. In other words, Adam was formed not ex nihilo, out of nothing. He was formed from pre-existing material that the Bible calls dust. The word dust in the Old Testament, uh, far in Hebrew, occurs 103 times. And in nearly every case, it refers to fine, dry topsoil of the earth. In other words, God formed man from pre-existing soil. The basic elements of soil, like chemical elements such as nitrogen, oxygen, calcium, water. So that's the first thing we learn about the creation of man. God formed Adam from pre-existing material. Second, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground as the first man. Now, I know that's an obvious point but it's worth noting. There's no reference in Genesis to other human beings at this time. The inference, therefore, is that Adam was the first created man. And this is indeed confirmed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 to 47, where he calls Adam the first man. 
And in fact, he says, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. A direct allusion to Genesis 2, verse 7. That Adam was the first man is confirmed by Paul calling Jesus the second man in the same verse. As Herman Bavink, the Reformed theologian, said, what Adam and Jesus have in common is that they both have no ancestors, only descendants. So Adam was formed from pre-existing material, the dust of the ground, as the first man. Now, some evangelicals like to say, yes, he was the first man, the first homo sapien, the first homo divinus, but he may have been a hominid before he was a man. God may have chosen a hominid, a Neanderthal farmer, a chieftain of a tribe whom he infused a soul into or with whom God commenced a spiritual relationship. However, this proposal is ruled out simply by the fact that the text plainly says that God formed the man from the dust of the ground. To take dust of the ground as symbolic of a living creature like a hominid is to stretch biblical symbolism beyond the bounds of common sense. But even if, for the sake of argument, we allow dust of the ground to have this sort of broad symbolism, perhaps to a hominid, there's something else in the text that tells us this could not be the case, which brings us to our third sub-point of the creation of Adam. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground as the first man in two stages, in two stages. The first stage is the forming of a human body. After God formed man, he is described as having a pair of nostrils. So the man was first an inanimate body body. That's the first stage. Then the second stage was the breathing of the breath of life into the inanimate man. Genesis 1 verse 30 speaks of the land animals and the birds having the breath of life in them, uh, just like Genesis 2 verse 7 does in relation to the first man. In this sense, human beings are no different to land animals and birds and fish. We are all living creatures with the breath of of life in us. But there is something different here. The act is more intimate than with the animals. God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of the man. Calvin and others see this as the ground for saying that God gave man a soul. At this point, man became a physical, spiritual being made in the image of God after knowledge, holiness, and righteousness, a cognitive, volitional, moral being like God. So that's the second stage. First a body from the dust, then a soul from the breath of life. In other words, in this moment of bringing this inanimate body to life, God made man in his image to be a rational, moral, living creature, distinct from animals. And only at this point did Adam become a living being, which brings us to our final observation on Genesis 2-7. God formed man from the dust of the ground as the first man in two stages, and then he became a living being. The key word here in this last phrase of verse 7 is became. When God was playing in the dust, Adam was not yet living. After God had formed the man from the dust, Adam was still not yet living. Only after God breathed the breath of life into Adam did he become a living creature. Genesis 1.20 and 24 says that the fish of the sea and the land animals were already living creatures by the time God made Adam. This is why Adam could not have been a hominid before this, because if he did come from a hominid, then he was already living. But the text says that after God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, he became a living creature. Prior to that point, he was not living. So how could he have been a hominid? So there are four steps here in the creation of man, four boundary markers to help us with an orthodox view of the origin of Adam. 
God formed Adam from the dust of the earth as the first man in two stages, and then he became a living being. These four boundary markers in Genesis 2-7, they make one simple proposition. Adam was a specially created man by God. The boundary markers mean that any form of evolutionary origins for man is excluded. Indeed, the exegesis presented exposes such interpretations as departures from the biblical text. The doctrine of man begins with the special creation of man in history. Adam was a historical man. Adam was a created man. The doctrine of God then develops with God's covenant with Adam, which brings us to our third point in this lecture, the covenant with Adam. This act of God entering into covenant with Adam is distinct from his act of creating Adam. And the Genesis narrative highlights the distinction for us. Uh, God first creates Adam as a man outside the garden. Then he places the man inside the garden and enters into a covenant with him in the garden. Here's how the Westminster Confession of Faith 7.1 explains it, drawing a distinction between the creation of Adam and the covenant with Adam. It reads, The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, notice how the creator-creature distinction is already established, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. So creation and covenant are related, but they are distinct. They are inseparable, but they are distinct. Which brings us to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. And let me read these verses again. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, you will notice that there is no mention of a covenant in those verses. But just because a word does not appear does not mean the concept is absent. For example, the word marriage is not used at the end of chapter 2, and yet we all agree that a marriage takes place. In chapter 3, the word sin is not used, and yet we would all agree that Adam and Eve sinned. So you don't need a word present for the concept to be present. That's called the word concept fallacy. And that's the case here. Uh, Another example would be uh, God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. The word covenant is never used. And yet Psalm 89 Uh, speaks of that covenant with David and calls it a covenant. And yet, in the original passage to Samuel 7, the word covenant isn't used. Well, it's the same here. The word covenant is absent, but the concept is present. But what do I mean by covenant? Well, a short and simple definition would be a life and death commitment between two parties involving promises or threats and obligations sealed with an oath. A life and death commitment between two parties involving promises or threats and obligations sealed with an oath. The best way to illustrate this is marriage. In the Bible, marriage is called a covenant, uh, Malachi chapter 2. It involves a life and death commitment between two people where they make promises and accept obligations in the relationship until death do us part. Rings are exchanged as a sign of the covenant. And it's the same here in these verses. What is established here between God and Adam is a life and death commitment with the tree of life being the sign of the covenant. This particular covenant involves a provision, a threat, 
and a promise from God with obligations for Adam. The gracious provision is explicit, seen in the opening words, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. The threat is explicit, seen in the command, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Adam's obligation is to obey. If he disobeys, then the punishment is death. So we can see how this is a life and death commitment between God and Adam. But what about the life element? Where's the promise of life in what God says here? Well, if the provision and the threat are explicit, we might say the promise of life is implicit. It is inferred by holding together a couple of things in the surrounding context. For example, if death is the result of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then conversely, it may be inferred that eating from the tree of life would be a reward for Adam if he passes the probationary test of not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We might say that Adam was called to fast before he was allowed to feast. But this is only an inference from verses 16 and 17. And the explicit provision of verse 16 seems to be against it. Uh, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. That sounds like on the surface that Adam had access to the tree of life since God's provision states that he could eat from any tree. However, Uh, Two important observations in the surrounding context would point against such an interpretation. First, the phrase every tree in verse 16, kol etz, echoes exactly the same phrase in verse 9, every tree, kol etz. What is interesting in verse 9 is that the phrase every tree is set in contrast to the two trees in the middle of the garden. In fact, the sentence about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil begins in the Hebrew with a disjunctive coordinate, setting verse 9b offline from the main line of the Hebrew narrative. Uh, Let me read the verse for you. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now... Or, but the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So even before we get to verses 16 to 17, the phrase every tree in verse 9 is set in distinction, not just to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but also to the tree of life. Every tree of the garden is distinct from the two trees in the middle of the garden. So that's the first observation. The second is in chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, after Adam has eaten from the forbidden tree. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Verse 22 suggests that were Adam to reach out his hand and eat from the tree of life, he would be doing something that was on the same par as eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had seismic repercussions for Adam and his descendants. It introduced the state of sin, judgment, and death for Adam and for the human race. Well, so too with eating from the tree of life. It would have seismic repercussions for Adam and his descendants. They would live forever in the state of sin, judgment, and death, and thus be irredeemable. 
Indeed, the situation is so urgent that God doesn't have time to finish his own sentence. He begins with a protasis, a conditional clause. Lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. There's the conditional clause. And every protasis, as you know as liberal arts students, should be matched with a apotasis, the main statement. So it's if X, then Y, or in this case, lest X, therefore Y. But God doesn't even have time to finish his own sentence. He doesn't even give us the therefore Y bit. He says, lest X, and then he immediately just puts Adam out of the garden. We might say that God thrusting Adam out of the garden is the apotasis. But in either case, the text clearly suggests that eating from the tree of life would be on the same level, on the same par as eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This interpretation is validated by the little word also, gam, in the Hebrew. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life. Note how the word also occurs in the context of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I should say that God does not thrust Adam out of the garden because he was never supposed to eat from the tree of life. No, he thrusts him out of the garden because he has forfeited his right to eat from the tree of life. As the cherubim with flashing swords in verse 24 indicate, the cherubim guard not just the way into the garden in general. Did you notice it in verse 24? They guard the way to the tree of life in particular. And that is what Adam has forfeited. In other words, eating from the tree of life was supposed to be the reward for Adam if he passed the test of obedience in relation to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Fasting from one tree was his probationary test in order to feast at another tree as his reward. But by eating from the forbidden tree, he had forfeited his right to eat from the tree of life. This interpretation is supported by the reference to the tree of life in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 7. The tree of life is granted to the one who overcomes, who conquers, who passes the test. This is why the covenant with Adam has traditionally been called a covenant of works, because it was through obedience to God's law that Adam would merit eternal life, of which the tree of life was a sacramental sign. Francis Turretin, the uh, uh, reformed scholar of uh, the 17th century, spoke of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as a sacrament of trial and the tree of life as a sacrament of life. And Adam was to merit the sacrament of life by passing the test of the sacrament of trial. Here's how the Westminster Confession of Faith 7.2 explains it. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. If I could put it in theological terms, eschatological life was conditioned upon the perfect obedience of a covenant representative. Eschatological life was conditioned upon the perfect obedience of a covenant representative. Now, by eschatological life, I don't just mean life that goes on forever. I mean life that is of a different quality, a diff in a different realm. It is life based on justification before God, imputed righteousness, that entails definitive, progressive, and complete sanctification, inherent righteousness, and glorification in imperishable bodies. That is eschatological life. That is eternal life. That is what Adam had the opportunity to win for us, which gives us further insight into who Adam was. 
as the first man in history, specially created by God from the dust of the earth, Adam was not a private man. He was a public man. This can be seen by the fact that he was the first man of all men. This is why I spent so long on the first two points, trying to show that Adam was a real historical man created by God to be the first man of all men. And as the first man, Adam is the father of all men. Acts 17, 26, from one man, God made every nation of the earth. And not just biologically was he our father, but covenantally. Adam is not just our biological first father. He's also our covenantal first father. His act at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had an impact on us, not just physically in that we die like he died, but covenantally in that we receive his sin and his guilt. If you look at chapter 3, verse 6, we can see here one way in the surrounding context that Adam is a covenantal head, a father, not just biologically, but covenantally, who impacts the rest of his descendants through his act. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was wise to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Notice at what point their eyes are opened, and they become aware of their nakedness. Not after Eve eats. After Eve eats the forbidden fruit, nothing happens. After Adam eats, everything happens. So we can see how Adam's federal headship had consequences for us all. Romans 5.12 makes it clear, through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and therefore death spread to all men because all men have sinned. Paul goes on to say that through Adam came sin, judgment, and death to all which means that Adam acted as a public man, not a private man, as a covenant representative, not a private citizen. Westminster Larger Catechism, question 22, puts it like this. Did all mankind fall in that first transgression? Answer, the covenant being made with Adam as a public person, not for himself only, but for his posterity, All mankind, descending from him by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in that first transgression. So, in sum, in the covenant of works, God condescended to enter into a solemn commitment with Adam in which he was promised eternal life and with him the whole human race upon the condition of his personal and perfect obedience to God's law. This was the covenant with Adam. So we've seen three things in the doctrine of man in relation to Adam. The historicity of Adam, the creation of Adam, the covenant with Adam. And now we come to some application of what we've seen with Adam for our doctrine of man. As I stated at the beginning of this lecture, Adam in particular is foundational for our understanding of mankind in general. The doctrine of man begins with the first man, Adam. His significance, therefore, can be seen in two ways. So this is our fourth uh, point, the significance of Adam, and two ways we see his significance. Number one, uh, Adam and human dignity. Adam and human dignity. Human dignity finds its most solid foundation and most persuasive apologetic in the doctrine of a special creation of man as distinct from the animals, as a creature made in the image of God. Those who wish to propose some kind of evolutionary biological process in man's origins introduce problems into temporary discussions of human dignity in regard to race relations and the life of the unborn child. In relation to the issue of race, if different ethnicities or people groups in the world 
do not all descend biologically from a human pair at the beginning of history, then the question is, are we all really equal? A look at the history of how Darwin's evolutionary theory has been appropriated into Western culture reveals how it has led to racism that we're still feeling or uh, still dealing with today. And the answer to the racism that we see today is not critical race theory or intersectionality, but the biblical doctrine of man, a doctrine that begins with the first man, Adam, from whom all nations of the earth descend. The Adam from whom descends every man. The Bible is clear. There's only one race, the human race. From one man, God made all the nations of the earth. This is and must be the beginning point for any redress of racism in our world today. We all have one father. His name was Adam and his blood runs in all of our veins. In relation to the life of the unborn child in the womb, William Van Dudivard, in his book, The Quest for the Historical Adam, asks an insightful question of those who hold to some form of theistic evolution. He says, quote, if our ancestors under divine sovereignty became human at some point after they began living, in other words, like a refurbished hominid, why should it be any different for an embryo that has not yet developed to a mature human form. In other words, even though the embryo is living in the womb, why should we view it as human? Maybe the embryo fetus only becomes human at birth. After all, the hominid was a living creature before it was infused with the image of God, even though it was not yet human. Which means that after Adam was specially created from a hominid, into an image-bearing creature of God, he could have turned around and eaten a hominid. And he wouldn't have been committing murder or cannibalism. So, as we can see, at the end of the day, all theistic evolutionary models carry consequences for human dignity. Without a historical Adam, specially created by God from the dust of the earth, there can be no solid foundation and persuasive apologetic for human dignity. We need the biblical doctrine of man that begins with the first man. The second significance of Adam, uh, Adam and human destiny. We've seen Adam and human dignity and now Adam and human destiny. Now, under this final point, I want to contemplate the state that Jesus, the second and last Adam, raises us to. Uh, we tend to think that Jesus just restores what Adam lost. But that's too simplistic and indeed misses a vital aspect of the covenant of works that God made with Adam. Uh, here's what I mean. The first state into which Adam was made was the state of innocence. He was created into a state of original righteousness but it was not yet confirmed righteousness. It was not yet eschatological righteousness. Adam was made very good, Genesis 1, 31, but he was not yet perfect in an immutable sense. The very good could become very bad because Adam was created able not to sin and able to sin. He had a choice which means there was a mutability and instability to his innocence. His original righteousness was unconfirmed. He could choose not to sin, or he could choose to sin. Of course, we know which choice Adam made, and having made it, he fell into the state of sin. In other words, Adam went from a state of innocence, a state of original righteousness, to a state of sin, a state of fallenness. Through the promise of Genesis 3.15, he would be brought out of that state of sin into a state of grace. But the ultimate state that he was destined for was, from the very beginning, the state of glory. The covenant of works was meant to be the means by which man would progress, advance, from the state of innocence, the state of original righteousness that could be lost, 
to the state of glory, a state of confirmed righteousness that could not be lost. Here's how Gerhardus Voss explains it in his book, Biblical Theology. Man had been created perfectly good in a moral sense, and yet there was a sense in which he could be raised to a still higher level of perfection. The advance was meant to be from unconfirmed to confirmed goodness and blessedness, to the confirmed state in which these possessions could no longer be lost, a state in which man could no longer sin and hence could no longer become subject to the consequences of sin, end quote. In other words, innocence was not glory. Original righteousness was not eschatological righteousness. To quote Herman Bavinck, paradise was not heaven. Adam was not Christ. Adam, as the man of earth, was made from the dust, and then he received the Spirit of God and became a living being. Christ, as the man of heaven, became in his resurrection by the Spirit of God a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47. And this is why Christ is better than Adam. Because Christ advances us, progresses us beyond where Adam began in his original innocence. Christ does not just restore us to where we were in Adam before the fall. He advances us beyond what we were in Adam. Because if we are just restored to where Adam was in the beginning, then we can again lose our righteousness. But Christ's work is not just restoration. It's consummation. The biblical theological storyline of the Bible, you see, is, is not simply an arc on a flat line. The biblical theological storyline of the Bible is an arc on an elevated line. We begin in a garden. We end in a garden city. Adam was made a little lower than the angels in his original state. In Christ, we will judge angels. And all that is to say that if there is no covenant of works with a historical Adam created from the dust of the earth, then there is no human destiny beyond the state of innocence, beyond an original but unstable righteousness. Without a covenant of works, all we are promised is potential integrity, not actual glory. So, we have four states of man, innocence, sin, grace, and glory. And it is the covenant of works with Adam that gives us the framework for discerning these four states. This is the second significance of Adam, human destiny. We were destined for glory. Which brings me back to the Shakespeare quote with which I began, Oh, what a piece of work is man. The problem with Shakespeare's view of man is that it is too natural. It is too far short-sighted. Man, in Shakespeare's purview, only reaches the height of the beauty of the world, the paragon of creatures. Man, in Scripture's purview, reaches the beauty of heaven. As the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15, 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. To quote Bavink again, Adam was not Christ. Paradise was not heaven. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. We have some time for uh, questions. Back here.
I think I need to speak in broad strokes here because I don't know all the finer details, uh, but I think it reflects a loss of confidence in the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. That, that do we really believe that Scripture actually has the answers to our modern problems, say race relations today? And where do we turn to when we face those kind of problems? And to find evangelicals turning to critical race theory or intersectionality and saying, you know, we need to um, absorb some of this and uh, combine it with, Bi with the Bible, with biblical teaching, and find a way forward because we've come to an impasse in our race relations in this country. I think it reflects a lack of confidence in the authority of Scripture, but also the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, so Paul in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 tells Timothy that the Scriptures are God-inspired, and he gives four uses of Scripture, which in Greek is a, a number for completeness. And then he says, so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. And I think for a minister, he, the Scriptures complete him for the good work of addressing an issue like racism. And uh, where do we go in Scripture? We go back to the beginning and we go to the first man. So uh, I'm speaking in broad strokes. I haven't read enough of critical race theory or intersectionality to be more precise as to why evangelicals are finding it attractive or thinking it's a good model that we need to appropriate. Um, but that would be my broad stroke answer. Uh, so Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, and Genesis 2, 4 to 25 appear at one level, some people argue, to be contradictory, and uh, you've raised the issue of the order of vegetation in chapter 1 is made before man, on vegetation day 3, man day 6. Chapter 2, man's made first, it seems, and then vegetation comes after. Uh, the way I like to read Genesis is that Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is a, is a bird's eye view of the creation week, including the Sabbath. And then chapter 2 goes back a day, back into day 6. So day 7 happens, the Sabbath, and it goes back a day and it zooms in on the creation of man. The key thing there is that the Hebrew word for vegetation in chapter 3 um, <clears throat> is different than the word for shrub and bush in chapter 2. And the words for shrub and bush in chapter 2 connect to chapter 3, thorns and thistles. And so I think it's saying that before there was any shrub of the field or uh, plant of the field, sorry, or shrub of the field on the earth, um, it's relating to thorns and thistles and also the grain that would be made for bread. And it's saying that basically man had not, there was no sort of harvesting of barley or wheat. There was scattered specimens of those things, uh, but they, they actually hadn't been uh, made by man agricultural, agriculturally yet on the earth. So I think it's referring to the weeds, the thistles and the thorns that come with the rain. So there's a connection to rain, and we know thorns and thistles, weeds come with the rains. And uh, it's saying basically before the fall, uh, before there were these kind of conditions on the earth, uh, thorns and thistles and um, uh, agricultural wheat and barley, those kind of plants, God formed the man. So I think it's not talking about the same kind of vegetation that chapter 1 is talking about on day 3. And it is different Hebrew words for vegetation on day 3, and then the bushes of the field and the plants of the field, which is chapter 3 after the fall.
just from Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I didn't know that. Um, you know, you could just show them Genesis 2, 23 to 24, 25, where he does wake up. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> speaks in a bit of poetry, a um, bit of romance, so hopefully that might draw people in, a bit of romance there. Uh, yeah, I, I would just take them back to the biblical text and say, here's the authority of scripture. He fell in, he was put into a deep sleep um, by God, <clears throat> and from his riven side came his bride, and then you could take them to Christ on the cross. From his riven side comes his bride. So. Bruce. Uh, none, uh, <clears throat> because in chapter 3, verse 6, it says, and she gave some of the fruit to Adam, to her husband, who was with her. Um, so it actually has this sort of additional phrase that it's obvious if she gave some of the fruit, he must have been standing there, but it sort of emphasizes it, who was with her. And I think what the Bible's trying to do there is that, you know, Adam's a son of God made in the image of God. And as son, he functions in three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And as prophet, he spoke, was to speak God's word to God's world. And he informed Eve of the command regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know that from chapter three because the serpent challenges her about the command. Well, where did she hear the command from? Because the command was given to Adam before Eve was created. So Adam was a prophet. He spoke the word of God to his wife. Uh, he was a priest, which meant he was to keep the holy place of the Garden of Eden free from unclean creatures. And he was to guard and keep it. And he was a king. He was to rule and have dominion over the creatures. So what Adam should have done at, when the serpent questioned his wife was speak like a prophet to the serpent and rebuke him crush him in the head like a king would do, and then like a priest, take the unclean animal out of the garden. So Adam uh, failed as a son to his father, and as a prophet, and as a priest, and as a king. Um, and so saying in chapter 3, verse 6, that Adam was with her is emphasizing his failure in his role as, as God's son and as prophet, priest, and king. Now, when Christ comes and is tempted by the same serpent in the wilderness, what does he do? What's the first thing he does? He speaks God's words. He functions like a prophet or acts like a prophet, should. And so that emphasis on Adam being with her at the time, that he's not absent as Milton makes out, that he's actually with her at the time, I think it's really emphasizing how responsible he's going to be when God comes to him comes walking in the garden and asks for Adam. And it's interesting that the first person Adam, uh, God calls for is Adam. Where are you, Adam? He doesn't call for Eve first. And so I think it's setting up the um, responsibility and the guilt of Adam in not doing what he ought to have done. It, you also have the inversion. You have the serpent speaking to the woman and the woman you know, giving the fruit to her husband where the, the order of creation was to be man as head of his wife and man and woman having dominion over the creatures. But what the serpent does is he inverts all of that. And so man being silent, present with his wife, but silent is just also emphasizing the inversion of Satan's um, work uh, of bringing sin into the world, uh, the inversion of the created order. So I, I, I love Milton, but he got that bit wrong. Yeah, maybe you could update it. Ethan.
Yeah, so sola scriptura is not solo scriptura or nuda scriptura. You know, it's not the Bible only. It's the Bible alone is the final authority of other authorities. So there are authorities in church tradition. There's authority of human experience. There's the authority of, of science or other things. And uh, as Christians, we shouldn't say, well, we're not interested in any of those. We're only going to look at the Bible. The, the Reformation principle of sola scriptura is that it's the final authority. So we shouldn't be scared of looking at the book of nature, as the Belgic Confession speaks of, um, that there's this book of nature. We should enjoy that. We should seek to discover things in it. But, um, as Calvin said, we need to read the book of nature through the skep uh, skepticals, <laughs> spectacles, <laughs> not, not with any skepticism, through the spectacles of scripture. And so, yes, there's the book of nature, um, but there's also the book of scripture and revelation, and that is the final authority. Um, there was one other thought came to me there, and now it's disappeared. But... Um, yeah, so we're, we're not to be scared of science or scientific findings, but if they come in, to, in, if they are contradictory to Scripture, then we have to submit to Scripture and say that maybe science hasn't found all the answers yet. Um, as regards the Copernican revolution and, and all of that, all I would say is, you know, when Scripture was affirming that the sun rises over that mountain and it sets over this one, uh, it, that's not wrong, you know. It all depends where your perch is. If your perch is on earth, then yes, the sun rotates around the earth. But if your perch is up in outer space, then the earth ro rotates around the sun. And the, the Hebrew writers that were saying <clears throat> from the rising of the sun to the setting were saying something that is actually true. It all depends on where you're standing, where your perch is. Yeah. Answers is adding. Um, well, just the Hebrew narrative, taking it at a purely literary level, the Hebrew narrative of Genesis 1 uh, <clears throat> is not poetry. There's just no Hebrew parallelism. Now, you don't need Hebrew parallelism for there to be Hebrew poetry, but that, that's a really big defining element. Uh, you then have in Hebrew poetry uh, a lack of definite articles, uh, the asher, the relative pronoun, the definite object marker, the et, and <clears throat> the percentage of those in Hebrew poetry is like less than 15%. Um, in Genesis, um, the number of definite articles, relative pronouns, uh, direct object markers are, are way, is way above that. So just from a literary perspective, to say that he, Genesis 1 is poetry and therefore it's symbolic, it's just it's not accurate, it's not correct. That you also have a, a verb form in Hebrew called the vayiktol, it's the five consecutive imperfect, it's the one that just makes the narrative move forward. Uh, there's 55 of them from Genesis 1, 3 to 2, 3, and they're in an unbroken line. You've got 55 vayiktols all in a row. So what's the Hebrew writer trying to say? He's trying to say that this is a narrative, this is story, this is history. Um, actually, chapter 2, you have a break with the verses 10 to 12 with the description of the rivers and the materials connected to the river. And that's all, the, the Vayiktol chain is broken and that goes all offline. That gives you a bit of background information about the garden. Then it continues the narrative again. So Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is, is clearly a historical narrative. And then I would also say, just because something is poetic doesn't mean it doesn't refer back to historical events. So in the Psalms, you have poetic retellings of the Exodus, uh, of even creation, Psalm 104. But that doesn't mean that the Exodus or creation wasn't historical. So people pit literary and literal against each other. And I, I don't think they need to be pitted against each other. I think they can be complementary. Um, yeah. So the way I describe it to the students at uh, Westminster where I teach is that 
Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is heightened prose. It's highly stylized. You get lots of rhyme, uh, not rhyme, sorry, repetition. You get lots of um, lovely configurations of seven. Uh, the first uh, <clears throat> letters in chapter, in verse 1, the Beit, Resh, Aleph, the bara, they connect with the verb bara to create. You, you've got lovely stylistic things, but none of it means, therefore, it wasn't historical. Um, so I, I think it's a, a non sequitur to say something's literary, poetic, therefore not historical. It, you know, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. All I would say there is that it's a completely different genre. It's apocalyptic, and you get these totally bizarre pictures of a figure that looks like a lion and a lamb. You know, well, we just know that doesn't relate to anything in history, you know. So, so apocalyptic literature is heavily symbol laden and you cannot take it literally. Whereas the Genesis narrative, as I say in the Hebrew text, right from the get-go, it's saying read this as an historical narrative. Uh, and then I would also say that scripture interprets scripture, Exodus 20, uh, with the fourth command about keep the Sabbath day. Four in six days, God made the earth and everything in it on the seventh day he rested. There's, there's scripture interpreting scripture. And again, Moses is saying God made the world in six days and then he rested. And you, you realize he's reading Genesis like it's a real historical event. I have one more question. Uh, Mr. Ware in the back. So on the point of um, human destiny, you mentioned that um, eschatologically, um, history is an art and it's an elevated art, culminating in glory, being built from the garden to the garden city. Um, I'm curious, can you unpack the glory or maybe some of the implications of the garden city? Like, what about that is more glorious? It's a city. Um, <clears throat> what am I trying to say there? <clears throat> Adam never got to create a culture in Eden. Um, he never got to Edenize the world <clears throat> from Eden. Um, and so what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, there's benefits of, cult of country life and city life. And there's a, there's a richness there that... Um, Revelation gives us, you know, these symbols of um, feasting, dan dancing in the streets, um, river of life. It, it sort of combines where creation was supposed to go. <clears throat> it combines the idea of, sorry, of city life and country life, which creation was sort of perfect. It was good, it was perfect, but it wasn't yet brought to its full mature um, potential. Um, so that, that's really what I'm getting at. Uh, I, I'm sort of using it loosely without maybe giving it a, a much precision, uh, but it's just trying to get the point that we move from a garden to a garden city. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I used to read the Bible like the flat line, like the ark on the flat line, and getting better understanding on the covenant of works and the parallels with Adam and Christ and Adam being a, a living creature, but Christ in his resurrection and ascension being a life-giving spirit that Ad Christ advances beyond Adam uh, has been really helpful for me to realize that what Christ will take us to will be even better than Eden. Yeah. Okay, with that, please join me in thanking Dr. Gibson.